on behalf of the museum i'd like to welcome everyone present here for our public lecture uh, today we have kewan mehta who will present on ornament as urbanity uh, kewan as many of you may know is a theorist and critic in the fields of visual culture architecture and city studies he is currently pursuing a doctorate at uh, the center for the study of culture and society bangalore through the manipal university <coughs> Since March 2012, he has been managing editor of Domus India. Kevan authored Alice in Bhuleshwar, navigating a Mumbai neighborhood, which takes the reader for a walk through the streets of the past um, of buildings in the native town of Colonial Bombay. He has developed and teaches courses in art criticism and theory at Gyan Prabha, as well as architectural theory at Arbor. Um, I'll ask uh, Kevan to present his lecture now. Thank you. Um. specifically for uh, one reason that the content material that i'm presenting today is integrally linked with this institution and its larger network which is not only the victoria and albert museum but its sort of preceding institution the department of the science and the arts which came out of the of the 1851 crystal palace uh, the great exhibition in london so to do this uh, to present this material in this uh, specific institution in this specific building is in a way in a way special because in many ways i work with the material that is outside or similar material the other thing is uh, just to kind of give you a quick uh, sense of what i'm presenting it it actually comes out of three different moments but obviously they've all got uh, interconnected in the period of my work to begin with it's uh, the material that went into and shaped the making of alice in buleshwar which uh, by now has become a certain kind of a thesis of its own in in a sense of trying to understand what a city and what a neighborhood is all about and how does one employ the tools of architecture and research to access material and then to interpret it when i was working with this uh, with this material i had realized that i was I, i had actually started working with a lot of individual images which are kind of motifs ornaments and you'll see some of them uh, in the first part and uh, i was in fact doing like a mock friendly presentation with my friend annapurna in annapurna garimela who also lectured here a few weeks uh, ago in bangalore and then she also pointed it out that kaivan you realize how much you're talking of ornaments and i said yeah i have realized although i've not thought much about it and she said maybe you should kind of start looking at your material from this perspective now onwards and that was in a sense uh, the beginning of bringing out ornament especially for an architecture student who has practically grown to believe in the classic idiom of ornament is crime and that ornament is part of a history that you don't want to visit and you should not be visiting and it's done with and it's it's wastage it's extra these kind of these kind of notions but as here i had actually personally also started enjoying them from that i kind of developed another uh, another project which actually started investigating different ornaments as uh, as theoretical subjects and i will just give you a peek into that because in the presentation there are certain images that show you where i started using the technique of the 19th century catalogs which were these design catalogs largely developed for textiles jewelry and architecture these were mostly the three areas in which these ornament motif catalogs were were developed and i started using that format to kind of looking at some of these some of these ornaments but clearly from a from a kind of end of the 20th century uh, perspective and while all that material material was uh, developing i had uh, dr rashmi podar and and abha narayan lamba inviting me to contribute an essay on the urbanity of shekhavati in the marg volume that just got released about 2 to 3 weeks i think uh, ago and uh, at that point for me it was like you know what do you say about an indian city you'll say there's a chalk and there's no chalk and there is chaos and there is no chaos and there is order and this is like this banal things and i will just repeat from one town to the other that bisau is like that and ramnagar is like that and lakshmangarh is like that and okay so what so it did not it did not sit in my sit in my head 
But at the same time, I know that I had expressed a desire to Rashmi that I wanted to work on the paintings on the Haveli. And she said, no, you work. The both of them as editors took their liberty to say, no, you work on the urbanity of the Shekhavati towns. And I said, okay. And I pulled in a lot of, when I was thinking of that, I pulled in a lot of my early work into getting to understand what is it about Shekhavati towns and what is this relationship between the visual and the urban? Because again, while looking at Shekhavati, it's not that the, the, this is the only place in India that has Havelis. You have Havelis everywhere. It is not the only place in India which has painted surfaces and painted walls. That is something that you find in many places. So then what is it that brings a particular kind of painted Haveli only restricted to a very small region in a moment of time, you don't see it before, you don't see it after, and they are not even really hot places or, or at any point in history that many people just lived there, like you find people living in Calcutta or Bombay or something like that. So it's never been kind of really rich, they've been rich cities but never kind of populated, crowded, living cities that have now faded out. They've always been cities between phase where people have moved in and out of it. So it was a lot of these, lot of these things that kind of made me sort of uh, work on proposing that in the towns of Shekhavati, it is the visuality that makes them urban. It is not about a straight road or a curving road. It is not about a chowk. It is not about two roads meeting. It is not about gateways and it is not about public places. But it is the quality of visuality that produces a certain kind of urbanity, which is what is very specific to Shekhavati, which you do see in some of the other towns. But it becomes extremely heightened as a, as a, as a scenario in the case of Shekhavati. So that's the sort of trajectory I want to uh, I want to present and um, forgive me there are a little uh, there are parts which are a little more theoretical also because the first half of the presentation I am reading uh, from one of my chapter drafts of my uh, of my PhD I'm reading about four or five pages from that and the next part I am talking from the from the published essay in the in the mark book on uh, Shekhavati thanks What I want to do is to go through a set of visuals just to give you, share with you the sense that I have had when I have been working or looking at some of this material. It's a very, very, very small sample, but you can imagine that I have, I have kind of maybe um, 70 to 80 times the, the material that you are actually seeing. And obviously, I have, I have worked in areas like this in other parts of the city or in other parts of the country also over kind of seven, eight, ten years now. But when I started with uh, working with Buleshwar, Kalbadevi, Girgaon, this was the material that was my raw data. I never actually went to any history books. Gazetteer came in very late. Uh, the old plan one I had actually, but I worked with a lot of material that was material on site, which you saw like this. And I, I very frankly, uh, one has stories behind all of this, but that's not the purpose of the lecture today. I just want to share with you a kind of visual experience. And you, very frankly, uh, the visual experience has to also be searched for in Buleshwar because you have to really strain your neck, left, right, top, down, to be able to see a lot of these things. Fine. Architectural ornaments are often understood as the flourish or the decorative patina applied on a building surface. At one level, the sense or idea of the ornament is argued and debated through in terms of architecture and form, However, the subject of ornament extends through art and architecture, history, into urban culture and the sense of the public. From the architect Adolf Luce's essay, Ornament and Crime, written in 1908, to the essay Mass Ornament by Siegfried Krakauer in 1927, 
the range of meanings and imagination that this term carries is something that this particular presentation will try to understand. The reference to ornament in the scope of this larger thesis first arises out of the need to understand the visual encounter that ornaments provided in the area which formed the basic case study for this thesis. In the attempt to try and understand buildings not only for their standalone formal or historical ideas, but for their relationships to notions of community and culture in the metropolitan space, the building often got dissected into sets of elements. These elements were the ornamental details that composed the whole of architectural condition. The reference to other 19th century moments in metropolitan situations like Paris or Budapest also opens up the nature of an investment into the use of architectural ornaments and the imaginations of these cities. Having said this, one will have to enter into the events and debates of the Department of the Science and Arts, which was one of the largest bureaucracies within the colonial empire that controlled or aimed at controlling the production of objects and their designs, artists and artisans. So actually the Bhavadaji Lard Museum comes from the Department of Science and Arts. So what you see outside produced comes from the system which they set up where colleges and museum spaces worked simultaneously. So in that sense JJ College of Art and the Bhavadaji Lard Museum are sort of twin institutions where both share. So what is displayed here becomes learning samples and what they produce there contributes to the learning samples. Continuing the argument and where they, where they were actually defining how do you teach art, how do you make casts, how do you for example produce, which is why one of the, uh, a lot of, um, what happens is that the teaching is done by kind of multiply. So you take, you take a particular motif or you take a particular element or say a jali, you make a cast of it and then the details of that caste could be sent to five other schools across the world through the Department of Science and Arts. So a caste from Bombay could be found in five other colonial cities that was distributed by the Department of the Science and Arts. At the same time, the, the principles of these colleges were expected only, uh, only um, Partly the Lahore school was a bit successful because in India you had Lahore, Calcutta, Madras and Bombay. So partly their job was also to scout the surrounding areas uh, outside these cities and bring craftsmen to engage with the architects and artists you were training. So it's also this kind of mixing and matching the, the non-formal training and the formal training. So these are just a few pointers of how the Department of the Science and Arts was composed. Continuing the argument with the reference to art historians and writers like John Ruskin and A.K. Kumaraswamy in context of their investment in the architectural ornament and issues of labor and craft will be cru crucial especially in light of their political and economic beliefs. The usual tendency while discussing architectural ornament has been to respond to the essay by Luce which has been seen as the signpost for the way modern architecture developed and also the way it grates on our contemporary sensibilities because of its racist and misogynist descriptions that sit so boldly on its surface. I don't know, actually very rarely I think as architecture students we read ornament and crime, but if you just read it, you, you won't read it again or you won't think of it again. It says stupid things like, you know, white food is, white colored food is better than colored food because you're just wasting kind of color and taste. It has these kind of examples in the way it kind of talks about ornament. It says that a person who is tattooed is a, is, a, is, a, is a criminal in waiting. So if he hasn't committed a crime today, he's sure to commit a crime tomorrow because he tattoos his body. So these are the kind of things Luce talks about. As much as the reference of ornament in an essay that strongly alludes to racist descriptions will be important, to recover the importance of architectural ornament in response to Luce is not the project of this paper. Krakauer, a cultural philosopher, as he himself likes to be addressed, begins his essay Mass Ornament by reference to the body culture and the examples of the Tiller Girls. The Tiller Girls we'll come back to later and you'll see a visual. The Tiller Girls were a group of military trained dancing girls named after the Manchester choreographer John Tiller. Krakauer's engagement with the term concept ornament has been strong in his two other works, Ginster, which was an autobiographical novel, and Jacques Offenbach and the Paris of his Times, which is a biography 
which is a biographical work based in Paris of the Second Empire. These three poles, which in a sense define the investigation into the term, idea, concept of ornament, to extend it into understanding of subjectiveness of urban life, uh, urban life and the relation it has to the sense of distinctive character both of the individual buildings and of the city or the neighborhood. So in a sense at one level uh, what, what this thesis will go on to present is that the ornament will shift from being an architectural element to being a concept. That is what is already happening in this paper and the reference that goes to into understanding a building or a neighborhood through those series of uh, visual encounters. Having laid out this structure, one can visit the painting, The City, by Sudhir Patwardhan. The man sipping chai, as if in the serenity of a hectic urban landscape, cordoned off by mild steel railings, along which another man stands resting his foot, a kind of loiterer or a hanger-on, watching the red of the BST bus pass by, which other, with, while other pairs of naked feet hang on. To continue some of these observations in, in his other works, one notices the remnants of architectural or construction detail as projected objects constructing a specific Mumbai or suburban Mumbai landscape. The street corner by Patwardhan struggles with the jigsaw of Mumbai, the metropolitan ornaments from a city that is deeply linked to its migrant past and present, where moving continues as an integral aspect of this metropolis while sleeping, waiting, looking out, loitering, continue to be a part of this landscape, they construct a space of experience and everyday life. The details of the mild steel grill, the rubble wall, the balcony balustrade, or the flooring start conjuring up images of a city that has so much defined itself on the experience of that which is visually identifiable and often visually differentiated from other contexts. In Gangadhar Gadgil's Prarambh, the which is a novel. The old Pandit who has just moved into the city to live with his nephew is describing his experience to the sights and sound of that which is different, that which is fanciful for its uniqueness compared to what he has seen before, also for its sheer scale and new building material culture. The old man compares what he sees in Bombay with Pune, the then capital city of the Maratha Empire clearly seeing the new metropolis as bigger and more impressive with its stone walls, sound and scale of the ports, the new buildings, the bazaars larger and much more crowded. The objects that are scattered in the metropolis, often disconnected from one another, start, suddenly start coming together as if they were always meant to be part of one narrative stream, one storytelling culture. But these scattered objects form the landscape of a na narrative that then itself becomes the metropolitan space, the space of Bombay or Mumbai. So again another set of images just for your visual encounter with them. Because in most of this thesis the aspect of visuality plays a strong role as to what do you see when you see. To then look at the works of Gigi Scaria, one observes his abstracting yet locating of architectural features like windows and balconies onto a new formal gesture. The landscape of building facades treated into elevation patterns of buildings, especially in newly constructed township areas, where the landscape is structured via a range of such elements fitted into patterns. Scaria dismantles these patterns and reconstructs new urban objects from the dislocated elements. In this dismantling and restructuring, the relationship between elements and their larger structural patterns gets focused. The kind of re-employment of a motif. So while in the case of Patwardhan, the elements get focused in their inherent form, but in critical parts of the painting frame, bring due attention to the existence of such patterns and their very inconsequential nature, yet a deep-rooted contribution to our imagine of an urban reality of space and its elements. In this conversation of ornament and pattern, there seems to be the constant struggle of the whole and the part. The relationship between a unit and the structure that transforms multiples of the unit into a woven structure. 
Pedagogy and discussions on art and aesthetics through the history of teaching art at the Department of Science and Arts engages into detailed conversations on the locatedness of ornament. Ornament which is largely seen as the aesthetics of the Orient is evaluated through questions of flatness and geometry, two characteristics that, cons that are constantly discuss that constantly discuss the superiority of the arts in Europe as against those of the Orient. The Department of Science and Arts, which developed out of the Great Exhibition of London in 1851, in fact was structured on the notion of collecting objects from different parts of the world and different cultures of the empire to build up a repository of objects that would then construct a knowledge of cultures and their artistic practices. The Great Exhibitions and then the DSA essentially constructed the world out of parts and fragments. They not only invested in acquiring pieces and fragments of architectural elements, but invested heavily in acquiring casts of types. These casts were further reproduced and distributed as teaching material through the schools of the DSA as material for practical training. Amongst all these activities, what is developed is theories of color and geometry, like you see in this example of Egyptian column capital types and flatness and stereoscopic vision as traits belonging to cultures, that a culture thinks in stereoscopic, a culture thinks in flat. So a certain typification that develops imagining that ornaments are complete objects of cultural sort of disposition. At one level, ideas of the artisan and the craftsman are developed herein. These are William Morris's notes on the different, for example, textiles. It's, it's from a catalog, actually. At one level, ideas of the artisan and the craftsman are developed herein. At another, a culture is described through a collection of objects. The ornaments from the casts and on-site studies are reproduced in catalogs through drawings or rubbings, some of which you saw earlier. In these studies, they were developed into readings such as how Arab art has no sense of perspective, or in the Orient, geometry is arrived at from a root other than reason. Arabic geometry is entirely entangled within the pattern form, offers a structural map of psychological meandering rather than historical progression, recuperable through logic. So these were sort of comments that you make on cultures or they made on cultures. Within these conversations and collections, what is also emerging are the notions and constructions of artisanal labor and the craftsmen. At one level, the way the DSA was focused towards contributing to industrial design development it assumed naive incorporation through its system of the pre-industrial craftsmen into the industrial system of production. Like what I said, you know, trying to get the artist or the architect that you're training to meet with the craftsmen from the hinterland and imagining that an automatic exchange is going to produce better industrially produced goods. But what may be of further importance to study here is the way John Ruskin, in his study of medieval architecture of Gothic churches, and Ananda Kumaraswamy in his first and very important and exhaustive study of the medieval Sinhalese art construct the sense of a relationship, nearly watertight, of a community to its labor and art production. In both these cases, only crying over the loss of art and craft at the hands of heavy and rapid industrialization in the mode of the arts and crafts movement. Kumaraswamy's thesis, in fact, extends into the location of a national culture and national spirit in the workings and production of the craft communities. So, an idea that sort of develops with the arts and uh, sorry, with the with the great exhibitions, with the DSA, where they link kind of uh, ornamental motifs and and crafts to rep as if they represent wholly and solely what communities or cultures are all about. Kumaraswamy kind of sort of extends that thesis into a, into another direction, saying that. I can understand what is national spirit by understand by, by, by kind of doing an anthropological study of the various craft communities within a nation. So to kind of completely do a, do a very beautiful exhaustive study of various craft communities in the region of Ceylon and to imagine a Sinhalese national spirit to be able to emerge from that study. So it's, it's crazy what, what happens with an, with, a, with, with an orientalist thinking actually takes, gets taken on by people who think that they are nationalists. But it's the same logic that actually continues and this is something that Tapati Guha Thakurta or somebody like Ranjit Hoskote calls it sort of auto-orientalism, that you become orientalist yourselves in the imagination that you're nationalist, but you approach the nationalist perspective through the orientalist uh, workings. 
His very anthropological work with the craft communities and their wares produces a reading of art history that is located strongly in social cultures. In his next and very important book, The Craftsman, he proposes the craftsman to be that unit of national continuity which was important for the historical continuity of a national culture. In all this conversation, one can at this moment bring in the, bring in the doctoral thesis that Siegfried Krakow wrote on the wrought iron architecture in Berlin. As Henry Grie, one of the scholars who writes on Krakow, in his important work on Krakow points out that what made the typological study of ornaments relevant for Krakow was a broader socio-historical framework. He focuses on how the creators of his various types of lattice work, this culture remains less architects and kings than the German craftsmen, who during all periods of history have forced inspiration coming from outside to undergo their personal interpretation. These bits are also not named and Krakow notes, practically no names have been handed down. Most of the art metalwork that comes under consideration has been carried out by the guild of locksmith. As Ree points out, there, is, there are no identifiable individuals here, but members of a guild that is collectively responsible and whose inner conditions are unknown. Thus, the basis is formed for considerations of art craft. Also, this art craft, through its techniques, stretches back to the Middle Ages, like in the case of Ruskin or Kumaraswamy. But Ree points out how this is based on an almost history-less tradition. We normally imagine these as history-less traditions. They are never time-based for us. The precise art craft nature of the ornament and its nature of being intensive, visually intensive and labor intensive. Labor consumption are further aspects by which the term ornament will need elaboration. In Krakow's thesis too, he emphasizes on the complex nature of ornamental patterns, literally, he quotes, a premium is placed on the complex in the aesthetic judgments past, the allusions to it being rich. In this reference to the rich where multiple motives are engaged in the construction of a whole pattern and where there is a kind of intercommunication amongst the motives as well as within the whole, there are strong references made to visual engagement that the ornament and the pattern demand as well as the intensity of craftsmanship and artistry in its imagination and production. In Krakow's words, open quotes, only gradually does the eye extract the details out of the richness of motives, close quotes. In this construction, there is the imagination of a group or, group or community of craftsmen, but also similarly constituted mass of audiences. So Krakow does one very important thing that we constantly keep talking of the crafts community that produce these. But he shifts that focus to like talking about which is the audience that is receiving this, which is, which is completely absent when you are talking of Kumaraswamy, Ruskin, etc. Yeah. But also similarly constituted mass of audiences, viewers and consumers of the ornament. Yet it is that in the way the eye extracts the details, there is an individual amongst the audience imagined. One has to realize that Krakow wrote extensively in the 1920s and 30s, contributing, like Walter Benjamin, another cultural philosopher of his times, of the times, on understanding, quotes, cultural conditions in the specifically modern metropolis. Close. In his engagement with two cities, Berlin and Paris, and writing for a newspaper, his training as an architect and his interest in social sciences. He produces writings and thinking concerning the experience of the modern metropolis with strong underlying thoughts of an epistemological and historical philosophical nature. As Ree suggests in his work on Krakow, a unifying theoretical figure recurs constantly in this presentation of Krakow's many years of work on the forms of modernity in the metropolis, first and foremost in Berlin and Paris. And this is the so-called concept of the ornament which might initially seem to have little to do with reflection on history and sociology. In the way Krakow approaches the term in his 1927 essay, Das Ornament der Maas, his important reference to the military trained tiller girls, he brings in discussion, bodily cultures, stadium crowds themselves arranged in patterns, forms seated in order tiers 
an aesthetic interest that is cultivated across international or regional borders. In discussing how mass give rise to ornament, but not being involved in thinking it through, he refers to aerial photography of landscapes and cities in the way it does not emerge out of the interior of the given conditions, but rather appears above them. He further says, in quotes, the more the coherence of the figure is relinquished in favor of mere linearity, the more distant it becomes from immanent consciousness of those constituting it. Yet this does not lead its being scrutinized by a more incisive gaze. In fact, nobody would notice the figure at all if the crowd of spectators who gave an aesthetic relation to the ornament would, would not represent anyone were not sitting in front of it. So I'll end this one here because then I go into actually a conversation on aerial photography and how aerial photography uh, works. And actually I was lucky at that point in time uh, when I was developing this thesis that I was also working on uh, Abu Dhabi and a huge amount of archival material of the way uh, cities in that region were photographed and aerial photography is a large way in which those cities have Abu Dhabi, Dubai, etc., Sharjah have been photographed what about now 30-35 years ago which is when there were still kind of small towns, villages in, in the sand desert. That was also the time that I started looking at a lot of colonial aerial photography and representation which may not have been flying but which have been from high points in old cities like for example photographing Delhi and other locations of the 1857 uh, scuffle, uh, the sites of all those encounters of the 1857 through aerial photographs and destruction of cities seen through aerial imagery. So there's a whole material that goes into that. But sort of having placed a couple of ideas here as to in, in what different ways does the ornament work. The ornament that is at one level visual intensive, the ornament at the other level which is craft intensive and how do we associate the relationship of craft to communities and cultures and then introducing the idea of the question of the audience and what is the mass audience to receive a mass ornament. So talking about Shekhavati cities where one was trying to kind of talk about the, the idea of visuality as the idea of something that is that makes something urban, one talks of Navalgar, Ramgar, Bisau, Lashmangar. They were all very well planned. So this is another image of the Tiller girls. And, yeah. They were all well planned on a grid iron system and most of these towns had a chowk, a market street, a bauli, a bagichi gateways as their urban elements through which the town was oriented, dharamshalas and havelis that formed clusters as neighborhood. Although hierarchy would have been part of these urban formations, reflecting the prevalent social relationship patterns, the sense of a mercantile community dominating the urban structure would also be evident in its fairly consistent growth through the main town. Mohanlas or neighborhood, neighborhoods would be an important aspect for this investigation. Shared plinths, spaces and streets would be common urban features. The Haveli is an interesting cluster of many different types and hierarchies of spaces. These mix and match of scales, the Haveli is an interesting cluster of many different types of hierarchies of spaces. These mix and match of scales even entered the neighborhood street by way of plinth or sometimes blank walls. We can go back to these images but I again just want to give you a quick sense of what we are talking about in terms of the physical characteristics of these towns. Okay. This network of spaces is at times organized around a structure of elements, jaroka, seat at the gateway, plinth. But at times these clusters of spaces also allow for a meandering movement. The dual principle within the organizational structure of these towns is its characteristic morphology which is further enhanced by the way all possible walls and corners in these built structures 
become surfaces for paintings and images. Havelis do indeed form the central morphological motif of the Shekhavati towns and their urban structure. The sense that you know actually every single corner that you will find, whether you can see it or not see it, gets painted. This is the Murarka Haveli actually. These specific images, the other ones are mixed from different places. Like the towns in Shekhavati, there is something about cities like Bombay, Calcutta, Delhi, Bikaner and Bhuj that makes them visually charged in a certain way and they are all cities that experience their definitive urban period in the 19th century. It should also be noted that the visually vibrant nature of these cities is very different from the cities of the Renaissance period or the Mughal Empire for example where the sense of visuality was contained within the urban morphology of the cities. Whereas colonial cities, including towns in Shekhavati, retain a very different or a distinct quality of visuality, a picturesqueness, which we have in the past described as ornamental. So it's different from the kind of the, the, the visuality that you will find in a Latyans Delhi or in a Mughal Delhi or, or in a Renaissance city like, like uh, Florence or, or Venice, where there is, there is the whole geometry of the urban spaces that adds to the visuality of these spaces. Here there is, there is no in that sense apparent sense of geometry of axis, clarity of roads etc. But normally this visuality has always been discussed as picturesque and picturesque in the very kind of uh, prejudiced orientalist notion of something that is picturesque and hence ornamental and hence nothing more than a bunch of pictures. They are vibrant and alive with images in stone, plaster and in paint and this has been seen as native in quotes and exotic as compared to the more colonial parts of metropolitan cities. They do not represent, they do not present or represent a larger thematic urban scheme through geometrical structuring of space and physical fabric nor are they easily tied by a stylistic idea. To the naked eye, they are a riot of images and styles. They are scattered pictures and buildings in a landscape that has no apparent form or structure. The yardstick of geometry and view corridors is largely missing. How then is the urban imagined in these examples of the 18th and 19th centuries? To revisit the experience of moving in any of these Shekhavati towns revives memory of native town areas in 18th-19th century settlements of colonial India. Town quarters that essentially take shape in these centuries and are closely linked with the mercantile culture of the time. So the mercantile culture is also something that I have positioned as important to understand this. A characteristic that is common to them and which is the crux of this exploration is their strong visual character. The buildings in these towns are literally surfaces filled with pictures and images. The buildings in that sense present, them, present themselves to the urban street in their avatars as screens, literally screens that are surfaces of pictures. These pictures and images often seem to be a cut and paste job. In the cities we are discussing, the ornamental or the pictures seem like collected panels pasted on building surfaces largely developing the street into a collage of images. The images and the pictures also seem to be freely borrowed from ideas and locations quite varied and far apart but in their rendering within these streets on these buildings they do not seem too much to care about the mix and match. So there is a certain sense of there is no kind of ethics of where you borrow from. So you can literally have images borrowed from here, there, Rajput miniature, Mughal miniature, Jaipur paintings, colonial sketch images, clouds that are from, from like, look like Chinese clouds. So it's a crazy mix and match. There is no clear ethics of how do you cut and paste. The only thing is they come together in one facade. As we are looking at this visual geography of cut and paste, 
a collage of disparate pictures becomes an uh, a collage of disparate pictures becoming an integral aspect of architecture we can claim this kind of urbanity as unstructured not bound by a logic or any ideological theme and also not within assumed virtues of planning urban spaces organizing built masses and unbuilt spaces however we can also propose a newly emerging urban form that is less morphological and more visual in fact we can understand how the visual is the morphological itself also one will notice that in these urban situations that we are discussing the built mass consists of individual buildings emerging along a street or road rather than buildings integrated into a thematic scheme the nature of this urbanity is dependent on the emerging and growing merchant class of the 18th 19th centuries and many historians and many historians continue to explore the intricacies of the mercantile structure in india during the colonial period the merchants and especially the marwaris who worked as agents and money lenders developed intricate networks of travel and relationships across the length and breadth of the colonial empire not only within the indian subcontinent but also in central asia and africa at the same time centers like calcutta and bombay were emerging as the sites of economic and political control and power and for a mercantile community these centers were the places to be in so one should start picturing the idea of home as well as the city as one that is not geographically located but precisely one that is geographically scattered yet connected along networks and this was kind of i think my second important contribution in this in this whole thesis where where from a geographically located notion of house and i've i've kind of uh, refuted the notion of the colonial binary normally the way it is understood that the world is divided into the home and the city like rabindranath tagore's uh, novel also gare bahire and that whole thesis i've refuted that thesis in my in my study of the chols which is also published in uh, the book edited by uh, neera adarkar where i've completely broken down the binary of the 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 inside and the outside and shown them as con continuously overlapping spaces here the second kind of uh, thesis that that i feel i contributed here was the question of the geographically scattered home the fact that these mercantile communities and trading agencies were large family establishment with brothers and cousins working in same business setups and spread all across the network networks in different cities and towns meant that the large undivided family was indeed divided and spread across a network the marwaris and shikhavati like more like most other mercantile communities also came from a history of shifting home even shikhavati town the shikhavati region has had a history of towns shifting depending on patronage which king gives them patronage which king gives them tax benefits or which region is a little more conducive in terms of weather rain shifting climate etc so shikhavati towns have had a shifting history they are not towns that have been there for ages depending on how trade networks shifted now in the 19th century the connection of cities through a network of railway systems allowed for an existence across different cities adding a new dimension of space and time to the sense of urbanity in this network it is important to remember the hierarchy between center and periphery which was a characteristic pattern of the colonial empire one of the important person who introduces the idea of the center and per periphery is anthony king in his thesis and here i have extended the center and periphery into the logic of the scattered home so you have multiple centers and multiple peripheries and how do you establish hierarchies between them but that's the whole kind of uh, thesis and theory around looking at colonial setups and mother city versus colonized city can one then propose that centers like calcutta or bombay which had to be treated with value and importance as they were the centers of trade and emerging capital were indeed seen by the trading families as home cities where they developed a base within their networks patterns and urban geography in this context the idea of a native town which was the central idea that i played with in my book alice in buleshwar in this context the idea of a native town and having a home far away that was original like we always have the sense of the native town which is like the maid 
or the dabbawala is going to the native town so that logic all of us live with and that's very apparent because this was one of the biggest thing that for example thomas blom hansen uh, analyzes in the way people reacted to the riots especially in 92 where the logic was to run away from the city and go to home so the city is only and always seen as a temporary home and never a permanent home far away that was original and distant from the new metropolitan site which was important not only important it had to be nurtured and it had to be invested in that investment had to be cultural since the space of the family was the space of culture so these are now one is again uh, one is going back to a lot of the 19th century conversations on family values cultural values community structure what is national culture etc but that's a completely different area of uh, work and research which i've not detailed out here right now even for the mercantile families where family was also the site for expanding business with the confidence and trust and safety also this home city or native place becomes the virtual center a locus for the otherwise scattered family and community spread across networks and cities so you will have a home in calcutta you can have a home in bombay but you also have an imaginary home in shikhavati which for many practical reasons may not be the home but in having your haveli there and a few members of the family there you are still maintaining the idea of a home that is outside the city but at the same time the city has to also be invested with the home because that is where your business and family kind of uh, relationships work out of but at the same time it is not a problem for them to imagine multiple homes because uh, this is a this is a thesis by harsh damodaran that um, and also Anne Hadgrove in her looking at Marwari communities, the, the sense of the scattered family that you essentially did business and for example these hundis and all functioned because you had a network of cousins. So you had a network of cousins which kind of travel from city to city carrying money, goods, IOUs, etc. So you had a sense of a family that was always largely distributed in the network rather than everybody being in one place and you are the only single male in the city that was not the logic the native town also becomes the other of the colonial fort town the towns of shikhavati and some others in the in the 19th century were hence not constructed on the same concepts of urbanity or ideological themes as their metropolitan counterparts would be invested with could one then say that like the native town in colonial Bombay where indigenous traders, businessmen and working population resided, the towns of Shikhavati were also indigenous and native towns of a type. The only difference being that the native towns in the metropolitan cities like Buleshwar, Girgaon, Kalwa Devi, that native towns in the metropolitan cities were thriving trade and market areas, also housing production spaces. Unlike the town in Shikhavati that became largely a residential suburb of a kind. So it's literally like a residential suburb of Bombay and Calcutta. Only thing is it is a train ride, like a large and a long train ride away. And it's not a one hour train ride away. Then became largely a residential suburb of a kind over a period of time. But this suburb was also not the periphery. It was the center for home and tradition. But in the logic of the home and tradition for the Marwari, the Shikhavati town is the center. An overlapping role of being center as well as periphery. The native town in the metropolis and the hometown were, were nurtured as sites for showcasing family as well as indigenous wealth, which was the newly emerging capital through trade. The indigenous is stressed here, but also enters the game of showcasing and the reason for this, for this lies in three pegs, competition, cultural encounter and historical memory. In a fertile financial landscape, competition between different mercantile families and business houses is bound to happen. In the 18th, 19th century, the, city, the cities and towns seem to be collectors of ideas. In a way, these towns and cities are cabinets of curiosities. The cabinet of curiosities is another very important working idea for looking at the 19th century, where traders and travelers basically travel to far off unknown lands, brought things and put them in one kind of cabinet which still you may find in kind of old Parsi or Marwari houses. A cabinet where you bring souvenirs, souvenirs from different parts of the world but those cabinets are the precursors to actually the modern museums that we know of. 
So the Ajayab Ghar, as you find in Kipling's Kim, it begins with the talk of the museum as the Ajayab Ghar. So the cabinet of curiosities is the Ajayab Ghar. Developing a landscape of so the, the towns and cities seem to be collectors of ideas. In a way, these towns and cities are cabinets of curiosities developing a landscape of visuals. This landscape seems to be constructed like the museum or the Ajayab Ghar or the house of wonder where paintings from different styles and genres, historical contexts came in. This is the century of world exhibitions in London and Paris, beginning with the Crystal Palace in London 1851. The large exhibition that happened of this nature outside Europe was in 1883-84 in Calcutta. Calcutta was the only place outside uh, Europe in the colonial empire that an exhibition to a large scale comparable to the ones in London and Paris actually happened. Which was a city, actually you can read Tapati Guha Thakurta on details for this if anybody is interested. Which was a city closely linked with Chikhavati. These exhibitions which claimed to collect and present the industry of all nations became large collections of objects of art and curiosity from ornamental pieces of craft and architecture to cultural reconstructions of cities and palaces with mock-ups and marquees. These exhibitions were imagined and structured as extensions of urban life of the metropolitan cities they were staged in, but they also created a bubble of experience into which world cultures were transported. So in London it was very popular that you know if you went to the Crystal Palace it's as good as travelling to the whole world because you could visit a sphinx and a pyramid if you walked like 14, 20, 30 steps you would come and see like a, like a marquee of Taj Mahal. If you walked a little you would come across a marquee of a Persian palace and if you walked inside a Persian mosque marquee you would probably have ballerinas dancing and serving you tea. So this was the experience of this, of this kind of collection where every two steps a culture kind of came and presented itself to you in large life size mock-ups. These exhibitions were imagined and structured as extensions of urban life of the metropolitan cities they were staged in, but they also created a bubble of experience into which world cultures were transported. Various avatars of such exhibitions were staged in India too, whether it was the exhibition in Calcutta or the coronation darbars that happened in Delhi where princes and large retinues travelled to. The world exhibitions resulted in the formation of the Department of Science and Arts in Kensington and India saw the establishment of the Indian Museum in Calcutta, 1814 and the setting up of art schools in the colonized metropolitan centers, Madras, 1854, Calcutta, 1854, Bombay, 1857 and Lahore, 1878. These institutions became sites for collecting and exhibiting quote-unquote Indian ornamental objects as well as works of quote-unquote fine art. This was the other binary very prevalent. Ornamental art, fine art. Rajput miniature and, the, and even Mughal miniature emerged as the Indian equivalent of European fine art and all of these examples would occupy space within these galleries and museums. In the way visual themes, pictures and images start occupying native towns and hometowns, there is clearly a flow of memory across different historical and geographical locations. We need to constantly imagine that picture ideas, now I am calling these pictures as picture ideas, are flowing all along the many networks of trade and metropolitan colonial empire. The imagination of home and city is not located in one place. In the case of these small towns, the idea of the cabinet of curiosities, which is the Kunstkama, the art room, or the Wunderkama, the room of wonder, alternate or simultaneously exist. They get actually employed as a binder or connector rather than a collection of motley objects as we often see the pictures in a haveli or down a street. So they are in fact establishing identifiable connections, weaving a visual structure through urbanity, a visual structure that is, that is negotiating politics of culture, economics and vibrant histories of the era. So in that sense kind of one is, one is kind of translating the experience of, of, of Shekhavati in the Kunstkama, Wunderkama 
uh, sort of binary and the location of picture ideas where it's also a certain way of not only collecting memory but you're also recreating recre uh, sort of sort of not recreating but creating history for yourself in a certain way because it was very popular for for small towns like Shekhavati to see Jaipur as their bigger bigger boss so you would imitate Jaipur in many ways like that you kind of say that okay Rajput is our is our heritage so you know you go to Rajput miniature so in that sense you're also sort of creating memory for yourself and and these were places where these kind of uh, culture tradition memory sort of in their very inverted comma uh, sense were being created and in a sense you were creating the idea home rather than the real home in any ways and then playing with the uh, with 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 a city like Bombay or Calcutta which became your basic structural home as far as business or 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 mercantilism was uh, as mercantilism required it because also in, you've, you've seen some of my Bombay images and you're seeing a lot of these Shekhavati images and you can see the sort of similarities that are flowing and and I don't have a collection because when I was traveling uh, much earlier I did not really take very good pictures and things like that but Bikaner, Bhuj, they produce a very similar kind of series of ornaments, motifs and uh, aesthetic uh, objects. This is Bombay, this is Shikhavati. Yeah. Now this is just to give you a, the next is, this is actually the catalog that I developed. I developed it for two motives. The idea is to develop it for more, but I've never really got back to this work. So it's a huge kind of a theoretical framing based on one motive, that is this. So I take one motive and then kind of weave a complete sort of thesis out of it. I've done it more in writing, but in kind of placing it in these kind of panels, I've done it with two. And this is how they normally get exhibited. As pages from a catalog. Okay. I can stop here and actually take questions, if there are any, that is. Otherwise, I'm happy to say thank you. Yes. Yeah. Uh, that ornament is looked or down upon or frowned upon mm. in mm. this thing. What is, uh, what is the theory behind that? that in what? In what? Sorry? You know, in, in yeah, yeah. right in the beginning, you ah. said that ornament is really in in uh, in uh, academia or in in uh, ah, co in college or in uh, there are in two contexts to that one is the, I think uh, I precisely mentioned that in the reference to Luce's essay ornament okay. and yeah. crime yeah. yeah which is the very important essay which is normally seen as uh, pushing what we later see as modern architecture which was kind of free of ornament. Although you have uh, a more contemporary theorist, and I'm just, it's a very common name, but I'm blanking out right now, uh, who says that, you know, white was the ornament of modern architecture. You, oh, huh, the color white. Because a lot of modern buildings were seen as white in that sense. But they kind of wiped out what you saw in 19th century, what we normally call the battle of the styles. So you had all the revivals, Gothic revival, classic revival, Greco-Roman revival. So what you will see in Calcutta, what you will see in Bombay you, is, is what the battle of the styles. And from that you come to the modern period, which is kind of the complete out of style, out of ornament. You have thrown out everything and it's clean form, clean line. Although it's not true with all. Now in a sense, now because ornament is becoming again an area of study, people are also going back to a lot of these guys and saying, oh, this is the ornament in Alto, who are otherwise seen as very modern architects. This is the ornament in Louis Kahn. So the meaning of ornament is changing beyond the visual, uh, no, beyond the visual object. Okay. Yeah. So but that was one reference that is the thing. But why, why is ornament being looked at in a derogatory manner? in the modernistic period? It's a cultural thing. Um, one has to get into a little history of Vienna, Austria and uh, the location of a lot of these guys in reference to Germany, that region 
and uh, labor also partly a reaction to what they had before where kind of uh, ornament styles were representative of certain power structures uh, political financial to kind of so you come to the masses where you do away with ornament you know to that from that it becoming a stylistic structure itself where you do a building without any ornament that's one history there's another history of colonialism so yeah which is colonialism 19th century uh, yeah so the, the discourse on the colonized people why the colonized people is we don't want to do something that our our colonizers did and therefore remove ornamented no 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 the the ornament and crime is a europe problem okay. huh. we just adopted it when we kind of adopted modern architecture we adopted that problem along without, with it without without understanding without asking a question yeah okay. yeah okay. yeah, okay. yeah. Okay. so the way we receive us i mean we i mean uh, architects huh. yeah or architectural historians or whatever that kind of category of people uh, so when you take modern architecture you take it with ornament and crime logic so it's a package deal in that sense but without really, without really getting into the questions the yeah no, no 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 later after colonialism it would become mesopotamian egyptian like you know the india assurance building that you have down the road why does it have some kind of egyptian references india has nothing to do with egypt in that sense but it comes from that trajectory Sorry. Does it also have to do with like the fear of color, like chromophobia, in the same way the colonial yes. embodies yes. the yes. fear of color? In Luce's essay, the reference to uh, color comes out very strongly. It's just like this hate. And funnily, I also read that essay when I was in Germany and I was cribbing about the white looking food and he's telling me to celebrate the white looking food. Yeah. So it's that kind of, so you can immediately have a, it was good for me to be in that context because then you immediately get that reference of the other person talking of color and food yeah. and taste. And, and, and you understand that, you know, like for European, uh, I don't want to get into this uh, binary, but just as a quick example, it's, uh, you know, what I realized something very importantly that we normally have this imagination that Europeans or Americans, they find food spicy. Actually, it's not finding food spicy. We are very used to a multiple taste palette. Like we can take three tastes in our mouth simultaneously, spicy, lemon, this, that and the other. So somebody very, very imp nicely said at one point to me that, you know, it's not spicy. I just can't take so much taste. And he meant it. He didn't, was not theorizing it. But it was a very good pointer for me. So I think it's a lot of that logic that also comes with, with ornament, the, the, the not being able to handle the multiplicity. But if you look at 60 years ago, when you're looking at 1851 Crystal Palace, Semper and all these guys who are the producers of 19th century are actually, they, they were dying, they were like for these guys who would not be able to travel to Mesopotamia or Egypt or something like that, it was the world was brought to their threshold. So you only have to step out of your house and make a trip to the Crystal Palace and, and Semper writes a whole kind of a paper on technology of knots in some whatever Egypt or Mesopotamia, the, the, the color scheme in Mesopotamian architecture and mosaic architecture, that kind of a thing. Volumes of textile, simple. And he, yeah, he goes on a certain, so, he gets so, so it's also we are talking 60 years apart, like I have also put, I'm doing this vast kind of historical jumps within about 100, 150 years, but still vast historical jumps. Yeah. No, so that was actually not my question. I was just adding to the discussion. Oh, yeah. uh, I mean, there is Chromophobia, the book, which is about the yeah. fear of colors in Europe, and it relates to everything from design to clothes to everything. Um, I, my question was more related to, you know, you were mentioning how the uh, construction of the kind of the urban cosmopolitan native town, quote mm, unquote, mm. is an assemblage of these of all the kind of, uh, you know, it's coming from somewhere, they're traveling, they're bringing in design, they're bringing in the craftsmen, they're bringing in a facade. Mm -hmm. How does this work vis-a-vis -vis the colonial town in Bombay? In the mm. sense, uh, is the colonial town what we would call the society, which is complete uh, Greek revival. So you'll have a complete aesthetic schema per building clarified. Yeah. In the other case, it is you don't have a problem with the mix and match in one building, which is nothing new also. Like there were very crazy buildings in various parts of the world, even during the Battle of the Styles. Like 
you know this guy writes interestingly of a building where the husband and the wife fought on a style so half the building is one style and another half the building is so one like north side elevation is one style south side elevation is another style so that kind of play is not completely new but in a sense the colonial building as a piece in itself is like more like the marker of yes. formalism yes. while yes. the native town buildings or whatever you want to call them are the incremental in that yes, sense. Yes, you can say that. Yeah, you right? can roughly say that, yes. Okay. Yes. And I have a question on this shell because I just had an argument with someone on it. Uh, is I uh, there's a shell if you actually go towards it's the Baroque shell? No, so I think it's Kohli <laughs> because the Kohli Mangal Sutra has the shell huh. and uh, the it. it's there all uh, there's a place right opposite Machimar Nagar building, Cleave House, which has this just just the shell it doesn't have any other ornament it, huh. they've just huh. taken out the shell and put it across. See, it's, uh, it's Baroque, yeah. gets towards Rococo, which plays a lot with shells and these kind of motives. But this is also what is interesting when I kind of get into some of the details of ornaments that how you can easily take one and translate it to another condition, actually. Yes, 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 yes. Which was the kind of the, the hint at the earlier that the, the production and the reception, that the two things you are playing around with here. working okay hi I missed out the early part of the uh, discussion in, uh, in the presentation yeah. but I just want to know whether you have touched upon the fact that ornamentation as a pastiche mm. as ornamentation vis a vis to ornamentation as a formalistic expression uh, yes actually in a sense that what I began by by kind of uh, expanding on some of these ideas and thesis was to say that uh, the visual engagement that ornament produces is something that is very important for us. And in that sense, even a painting becomes a formal thing for me. So in the case of Shikhavati, the painting is about the form of the building. At a very technical level, it is a 2D thing. Okay? So it is in that, after a point for me, the argument of whether it is just pasted or whether it is flat or whether it has a uh, depth is not important for me because actually the paintings in Shikhavati create the form. So in that way the pastiche or the surface is the form creating thing which is which was also one of my arguments when I was looking at the Chol buildings. So this kind of relationship between the inside and the outside or that contributing to form is not important. The outside generates one form, the inside can generate another form altogether. And these buildings essentially play around with that. Yeah, that's my larger thesis sort of on this, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I know he's an architect so he would have got, uh, and I could see Shaku nodding her head, so. <laughs> uh, you know, in the classic way, we would say form is very like, stupidly say, but form is three-dimensional and surface is two dimensional where in, one, in, in some of these cases I make the argument that whatever happens on the surface gives the third dimension. Simply putting it, actually it produces the form of the building. We can go back. Where, where, where was that from? The, I, I, I didn't get it where it was from almost about the third slide. Mostly I should know, but I may not know. This. Right at the beginning. On the bridge, yeah. Ah, ha, ha. Gigi's car, yeah. Gigi's car. Ah, ha. Ah, okay, okay, okay. Oh, that's, you know, the background is the uh, ceiling. I thought so. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Was that put up just for an exhibition or something? Was it? Uh, you know, I don't really now remember. Uh, but I'm sure, no, obviously it was put there and photographed. But the the actual structure was there in Kemul when his exhibition happened there, okay, and the work is also that the, he takes that one motif and travels it to different places. So that also comes about. No, it's okay. You don't need to go back. It was just that I was. Yeah, these yeah, ones. No, yeah. That, that one. So what, some of them are in the Delhi setting. Some of them are in the Bombay setting. Yeah, this, this is That's this the, is this yeah, is great. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. 
but the wheel itself was there in Kemul when his exhibition show happened yeah thank you all for coming and thanks for the questions actually thank you